welcome, Professor Stajano. Uh, we're doing uh, a Q&A today about computer science uh, in Trinity. Um, and I just thought I'd, I'd start off by asking, so, so what does computer science mean to you? Well, computer science is um, really foundational at this stage. We are living in a digital society and everything we do is mediated by computers. Uh, you may not care about it, but everything you do, even if you don't, don't mind about it, uh, involves computers of any sort. Uh, there are um, many more computers than human beings on the planet. And uh, if you're talking about the microprocessor chips and so on, um, even just the uh, ARM, uh, which is a computer company that uh, was started in Cambridge by some people from my department, Mm -hmm. um, has now produced uh, over uh, 130 billion processors, which is like more than, than 10 of the per, per person in the world, right? Wow. Uh, and that's just one company, right? There's many more. <laughs> Computing has uh, pervaded our society to an incredible extent. And so everyone who lives in today's digital society is affected by how computers work. So having uh, a deeper understanding of computing uh, of the kind you get by doing a degree in computing at Cambridge will really empower you to become a master rather than a slave in this digital society. You will be able to make computers do things instead of just being subject to what computers do. And mm. so uh, it's like living in a world where with with computer knowledge and computer understanding, uh, you can essentially tell the computers what to do. You can rewrite the laws of physics of this world. It's, it's like having a superpower being computer literature. That's, that's fascinating, yeah. Never thought about it as having a, a superpower, but I think in, you know, in, in, the, in the current age and moving into the future, that's, that's exactly what it is. Absolutely. Um, and so, so what's it like to, um, to study this, this superpower at, at Trinity? Well, the way you study any subject uh, in the University of Cambridge is that you attend lectures in the morning, even though things are slightly different this year because of the COVID situation, and the lectures have changed as well. Uh, but anyway, you have these lectures in the morning, and then in the afternoons, you have what we call supervisions, which are a peculiar thing that doesn't happen at many other universities, where instead of one lecturer speaking to a class of a hundred pupils, as happens in the morning, you have uh, maybe just a couple of students, two or three, sometimes only one, uh, with one expert in the field, who could be the professor that lectured them in the morning, but because of scale, it can also be someone else. It can also be uh, another uh, um, teacher in some other topic who also knows that other subject it could be a PhD student, it could be, uh, anyway, someone who is going to go through the material with a student and answer any questions the student might have and which could not have been asked during the lecture because of time constraints. Right. So in, uh, in the university, there are many departments where you do many subjects and many colleges. And uh, you can have like a matrix of departments and colleges and so, uh, for every department, you're going to have students from all the colleges. And for every college, you're going to have uh, students studying uh, all the various uh, subjects that are done in the various departments. So studying uh, computer science or anything for the matter in Trinity uh, means you are going to go to lectures in computer science in the morning, but in the afternoon, you are going to have supervisions within your college by subject experts provided by Trinity. And mm -hmm. then, because you are in Trinity, you are going to be mingling with many other students in Trinity who do other subjects than computer science. This is a peculiar thing of the Cambridge system, which uh, is actually extremely beneficial in terms of widening your horizons and the connections that you make when you are young uh, and you are doing your first undergraduate degrees are things that will last you a lifetime. Now, when I was uh, an undergraduate, I, was, I, did, I did my PhD in Cambridge, but not my undergraduate degree in Cambridge. And I was in a university like in most other parts uh, in UK and in the world, you just um, congregate with other people who do your subject and that's it. And I was doing engineering. So I only ever saw other engineers for the whole duration of my undergraduate degree. Whereas in here, 
you can be doing computer science, and then you can mingle with people who do uh, archaeology, history, or medicine, or literature, or a, a bunch of other topics, which will make you realize that the world is bigger than yeah. computer science, exciting though computer science may be. Yeah. So that's what it's like. And also, I suppose, give you um, ideas for where potentially you could apply what you've learned in computer science to, to other disciplines, perhaps. Oh, certainly, yes, because computer science is something that uh, helps you figure out how computers work, uh, but can then be, your computers are just a tool. And then what do you do with the tool? It, it depends on the problem you have. And then you apply this tool to the problem. And computers are the most versatile tool that exists, so they can solve very many problems. Uh, but the interesting thing is the combination of the tool and the problem from which you come up with a solution. So yes, uh, speaking with other people who are, uh, as so to say, in the real world, means you are exposed to problems that people uh, have which they are not able to solve by themselves because they don't have your superpower of knowing how to tame computers, but you can make computers do something that solves the problem. That's really exciting. Fantastic, yeah. Um, and so if you're a prospective student and um, you're thinking of uh, applying to, to, to do computer science at Trinity, what, would, um, what does it sort of look like um, in year one? When they arrive to Trinity, what would they? What do they study? Is it sort of straight into the superpowers or is, is there some grounding? Uh, well, nowadays, most of the people who uh, come to, um, to computer science at Cambridge, uh, and there's, there's a pretty um, narrow funnel, and it's a pretty strong selection. We only take about one in 10 or less. Uh, are people who are already excited about it to some extent and have had some experience. So uh, almost everyone has had some exposure to programming, has dabbled in doing some computer things. Yeah. Now, uh, we appreciate that and we are very happy that people show their enthusiasm and, and so on, but we do restart from zero. So okay. we restart uh, from a basis where everybody is equal and we, um, teach you from the fundamentals. In fact, to put everyone on an even footing, we start by teaching a language that is very obscure and that practically nobody has ever seen before, oh, regardless right. of how much experience they have had. This is a, a rather esoteric language with foundations in the theory of computer science, which is uh, not, a common, um, not a commonly used thing, certainly not a common introductory language, and this has the effect of both setting the students onto a solid foundation because it is the kind of programming language with mathematical basis that lets you prove properties of your programs, which is very useful if you want to do something robust. Uh, but at the same time, it kind of puts off the people who've already written lots of code by themselves. And it's usually rubbish code by the standards of, of, of the profession because they haven't learn how to polish things yet. Uh, but it means that you don't have a class where some people sleep through it because they think it's going too slow because mm -hmm. it's new for everyone. And yeah. so, yes, we, we, we put everybody in uh, at, at the foundational initial level where it's new for all. We teach them from start, then we gradually move into things that are slightly more mainstream. Uh, but by that time, they start to have a, uh, common language, common ways of thinking and getting rid of bad habits that they may have acquired before. Uh, right. I mean, when I, I as I said, I, I didn't do, uh, I didn't study programming in Cambridge. And if I had, I studied programming so long ago at university that it would, would have been different anyway. Uh, but I came to university uh, having done a lot of programming on my own because I thought it was the most exciting thing. Uh, and, um, and I was a bit blasé in terms of, you know, why do I have to do a course on programming? I already know how to program. And of course, I didn't have the faintest clue that I really <laughs> didn't have any idea how to write a proper program. I mean, I could put things together, but it was all rubbish, right? Uh, and by doing uh, programming at the university level, then you learn how many things that you can cobble together would never hold if you were doing something of a much bigger size than what mm. a teenager can do in their bedroom. So uh, as a teenager in your bedroom, you can make almost anything work on a scale of what the teenager in a bedroom can do. Yeah. But none of that stuff 
would then scale up to building the software that makes uh, the computers in your car work, uh, the, the automatic uh, uh, anti-lock brake system work. And you have to make, make sure that it never has any bugs. It, it, it never happens that you press the brakes and and then uh, it doesn't do the anti-locking function because yeah, there was a bug or something you didn't think of, right? Uh, or uh, the software that uh, uh, launches a missile or the software that uh, makes an airplane fly or uh, any of these much bigger things cannot be dealt with with the techniques that you use when you're writing your small scale program and any hack will make it work. And so you have to learn a completely new mindset in order to uh, bake in reliability from uh, the yeah. design stage, right? So, so it's great that people have had experience because they will have uh, some familiarity with some of the things that can go wrong, but we expose them to, um, how to scale up to much bigger things where you do need to have much more uh, control over the structure of what you do if you want any chance of it uh, working reliably. Yeah, that's very interesting. And um, I'm hoping no one, none of these prospective students at home are um, thinking about programming airplanes just yet. Um, yes, well, it's just as well. <laughs> exactly. And it's, um, it's also, I think, what you know, what you spoke about, the fact that it's sort of an, it's a level playing field um, to begin with, I think it will be very reassuring uh, to many prospective students. Um, so it's, it must be very reassuring for students to know that um, they start on a level playing field when they begin at Trinity. Um, but also you mentioned um, programming, that, that some of the students do come with some experience of it. And so with this level playing field to begin with, what would you suggest that prospective students, um, what, or what can they do to prepare best to, um, to begin the course? Well, uh, the fact that we restart from zero uh, should not discourage people from playing around with computers on their own. In fact, the more they do so, and the better it will be because it will uh, stimulate their curiosity, will make them want to uh, be ready to do more things than the ones that they can figure out by themselves. So yeah. yes, uh, try, to use the computers uh, in a way that makes you the master as opposed to just a passive consumer. So the, the, the computer, it is possible nowadays to use a computer like a television in the sense someone else has produced content and you just consume that content. That is very passive and very um, a very poor experience and not conducive to being admitted at Cambridge. Uh, mm. If you want uh, to be among the people that we actually take on. You have to have an interest in computers where you make them do what you want. Okay, so you have to discover how to make the computer solve a problem. Uh, and um, so let me just say, uh, things that will help um, is acquiring the mindset of solving problems. And it doesn't matter what kind of problems they are. Uh, they can be, you know, logic and mathematical problems. In fact, we recommend people study more maths instead of trying to study programming at uh, mm. uh, at school before university, because yeah, the I'm stuff that they, you study at, at, at school in terms of programming is usually pretty basic. And also it involves a lot of, you know, that's how you use Excel and Word and so on, which is not computing. It is just being a passive user of a program someone has uh, already wrote. So. If you experiment, uh, you get yourself one of these uh, uh, Raspberry Pi computers, you try, hook it up, connect something else to it, make it move motors and robots and uh, write your own programs to do things. Uh, and if you get logic puzzles, well, just, just for the sake of argument, um, uh, this morning, my stockbroker uh, sent me, they, they do that every week, they sent a puzzle. And if you solve this puzzle, then you get the discount on the next operation that you do. Right. Right. Uh, so uh, for the past three weeks, I started paying attention to those puzzles and uh, I would get this puzzle and uh, it's a kind of logic puzzle. Let me see if I can find one. I hope it, this doesn't make this too long, but uh, you can solve the, pu the puzzle just in your head, I suppose. Uh, but it is also fun to see if you can uh, have a computer solve it for you. So, okay, that's the kind of puzzles I am talking about. So I can I can see how that relates to to, to the maths that you were speaking about because right. you might use algebra to 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 you know to generalize a problem 
Uh, you might, you might, or you might not. So let let's see this uh, this particular prom. Warren, a character called Warren, picked one picked up one of his usual five card draw poker hands at his weekly game night. All of the cards were below a jack, ace high, and no suit was missing. So all of his cards were two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or 10. That's the card he had. The cumulative total of the even cards and the odd cards were equal. So he's got five cards. If you add up the cards that have an even number and you add up the cards that have an odd number, you get the same result. The spades totaled 14. The red cards totaled 10. The lowest card was a heart. Okay, so these are the uh, constraints of the problem. Within those constraints, can you find uh, what his hand of five cards was? Mm -hmm. And then you, you can do many logical deductions. Say, well, if this is the case, then I must exclude this. And you can, you can approach this through logic. Yeah. Uh, and I thought for me, it would just be fun. It would just be a relaxing thing to just set the computer to try and find the solution where the problem was uh, not so much using the logic, but was how to encode those constraints in, in a way that the program uh, would understand and uh, then be able to check. Then the program does it in a very stupid way, which is just check all the possible combinations of five cards right, and see yeah. which ones matches these constraints. Yeah, yeah. And so, the challenge here was not to be intelligent enough to solve the problem. The challenge here was to be intelligent enough to recast these statements, such as the lowest card was a heart or the, the number, uh, the total of the even cards was the same as the total of the odd cards in a way that the computer could then check automatically. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it, it, it took me about half an hour to write something that uh, would do that. And it took me another hour or two to remove the bugs from what I had written. And then at the end, I had the program run through, you know, hundreds of thousands of combinations and give me the answer. And then I sent the answer. And then I was one of the first three people. So I got to discount for the next thing. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, doing that kind of stuff on your own, uh, you may have a problem that's perhaps posed as a logic problem, but you try to solve it with your computer and you try to expand the boundaries of what you can make the program do on your behalf. Yeah. That's the kind of attitude that will be a good preparation for, um, for computer science um, at university undergraduate level. That's, uh, that's brilliant. So um, not, only, not only is it um, expanding the boundaries of what you can do, but you can also use it to save money in occasions as well. What right. could be better? <laughs> <laughs> um, are there, you, you mentioned uh, maths being, um, being an important um, component of, you know, of, of, of pre-18 study. Is there any other A-levels that you'd recommend um, studying that might, might help or, or, or indeed are required for, for computer science? Well, uh, we recommend maths, more maths. Uh, and uh, I would also recommend physics in that physics is something where you have to be familiar with maths, but then you have to apply them to real world constraints. Uh, physics, uh, there are laws of physics that uh, the universe is made like that. And with maths, you can solve problems where you know, there are some boundary conditions that nobody can overcome, which are the laws of physics. Within those constraints, uh, can you predict what will happen? Can you make something work the way you want and so on? So uh, physics is a realm in which you use maths, not just for the pure pleasure of, of doing maths and, and solving equations, but for actually solving problems. So in that sense, it is a good playground. Now, the type of maths that are using physics are uh, continuous mathematics, uh, of which I studied a lot and lot when I was little, when I was an undergraduate, but I basically never used myself in, in my own field. I mean, the stuff that I do is more uh, all discrete things and combinatorics and so on. So the type of maths that I use now may be, you know, um, very uh, distant from the type of maths that are used mm -hmm. in physics. But regardless of that, having studied a lot of physics, which I also did, uh, just gives you a good grounding and good framework and good mindset for solving problems based on some fundamentals that you then can reapply and see in many other things. So it doesn't actually matter what you do. It doesn't matter that the actual uh, physics stuff that I did when I was 20, uh, I've never had to use in practice in my professional or academic life, but it still gave me a good the skill. mindset, a good yeah. framework and so on. Um, 
and it's the same for 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 all the maths and stuff like that. It's just a, just a good preparation, even though you may never reuse those particular skills. Um, it's but, it's a good good ground. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I want I want to to give a message to the, those people who are applying here. The stuff that we are going to teach you at the university, right? It's important, but it's not the most important thing, right? So the stuff that they taught me when I did engineering and computing uh, when I was 20 uh, did not include the most important things that I do now uh, in my academic position and in my profession. And you know, I have companies on the side and so on. Uh, for the good reason that they weren't, they hadn't been invented yet. I mean, when I went to university, the World Wide Web didn't exist, for example, right? So they couldn't teach me about, you know, web protocols and all that stuff. I had to learn all that by myself. So what matters when you are at the university is that you get a good grounding in the fundamentals that are never going to change and that you learn how to learn new things. Because over your career, there are going to be many more new things that you must learn, which we cannot teach you because at the time you are with us, they don't exist yet. So they will only be invented 20 years from now. Yeah. And you have to be ready for learning new things that don't exist when you come to Cambridge. And so you will be learning many hard, difficult subjects. And the fact that you learn how to learn the hard subjects is the most reusable of the many skills that you will acquire in Cambridge. Really, really interesting. Um, with you know the pace that technology changes and moves forward, I can uh, I can see that a great you know learning how to adapt to, to the times would, could be extremely beneficial. And and I assume actually you know on that on that note, there must have been um, the, the 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 next question I was going to ask was about where students go to following their degree. But you sort of already touched on the fact that students who you've probably taught in the past have adapted to real world problems that are you know, probably around now or indeed haven't even happened yet. Well, it's, it's obvious to think of people who get a computer degree uh, then go to work for uh, the big computer companies. I mean, nowadays, uh, if you look at the, uh, what drives the world economy, if you look at you know, the um, S&P 500, which is the uh, stock market index of the largest economy in the world, uh, the top companies are all things like, you know, uh, computer things, computer internet companies, the, the Amazons, the Microsofts, the Googles, the Facebooks, and so on. They make the bulk of the yeah. largest uh, apples, of course, uh, most uh, lucrative and uh, most uh, valuable companies in the world. So it's obvious that if you have a computer science degree, that uh, is a possible career option. But as we were saying at the start, uh, because computers are so pervasive that there's basically no activity uh, in today's society that is not in some way mediated by computers, then clearly there is a place for uh, competent computer science uh, in any field mm. from, uh, you know, even if it doesn't have computer in the name, it will be using computers, uh, whatever, whatever that is, from um, even things that are, um, as a general topic, unrelated to computing, uh, things to do more with you know uh, arts or transportation or uh, you know making movies, whatever. There's always a computer in there. Of course, making movies nowadays, there's you know, gazillions of computers. You're going to edit the video that we are doing. You're going to do that on a computer. And there's lots of things that used to be done by splicing things with scissors. Nobody does like that anymore. Everything's on a computer. Everything, absolutely everything, uh, involves computers. Well, in my specific subfield of computing is computer security. I'm a professor of security and privacy, and I'm also the head of the Academic Center of Excellence in Cyber Security Research at this University of Cambridge, which is uh, endorsed by GCHQ. So in my field, there is predictions from the analysts that uh, within the next two or three years, worldwide, there's going to be a shortage of 1 million competent cybersecurity experts that industry oh. and governments and uh, organizations around the world will want to recruit and they will have the job advert out. There will just be not enough people to fill in those posts. There's just not enough people with these skills. 
And um, I have been involved for the past few years in initiatives to um, raise a new generation of talent in cybersecurity because we are going towards uh, a situation where more and more of these people will be in extremely great demand. Yeah. Wow. So um, really, really, really important um, to, to, to the wider world and to the, to the problems that we face as a society. Um, uh, so, and finally, I think uh, if, if you were to offer, you, you've said so much useful information for prospective students out there, but if you were to say one thing, one top tip that you could offer to, to students thinking about applying to Trinity, what would that, what would that one, t- one tip be? I think my top tip about uh, this is uh, enjoy it. Okay, so you should go into computers not because it's going to be a lucrative career. You should go into computers because you enjoy it. You love doing it because it's really fun. It's really, it's like having a Lego construction set for the mind. You're able to build anything you like and you're never missing a piece because you can always make your own piece by writing another piece of code. You can really make anything you want happen if you put enough of your brains to it. And this is such a, an empowering and liberating feeling that I think that there's no activity that is as enjoyable as computers. And in fact, one thing that uh, we old timers say is computing is the most fun you can have with your clothes still on. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor. <laughs>